Hi, my name is Helen Wilsey, and today I'm excited to tell you about some of my postdoctoral work using frogs to understand developmental disorders. First and foremost, I'd like to thank John Wallingford and the staff at Development for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you today. And specifically, I'll be telling you about a story that we recently just published in Development about the neurodevelopmental disorder risk gene dirk one a and its role in ciliogenesis and control of brain size in Xenopus embryos. My work is really a response to the watershed that has happened in the last 10 years and our understanding of genetic risk for neurodevelopmental disorders and especially for autism spectrum disorder. And this comes from pioneering work from one of my mentors, Matthew State, as well as others, and performing DNA sequencing on families in which there's an affected child with unaffected parents. And using this strategy, we now have 102 high confidence, large effect autism risk genes. And so I think that this list of risk genes is an unprecedented opportunity to start to unravel the molecular mechanisms underlying complex neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disorders. However, with such a large gene list, and especially with genes that we know are pleiotropic during development, uh, we were, uh, I, I was really looking for a higher throughput model organism to begin to be able to look at many of these genes in parallel and identify phenotypes in common to multiple different genes. And so with that in mind, I chose Xenophis tropicalis as my model organism of choice and reached out and, and started this work with uh, Richard Harlan at UC Berkeley. And so there are many advantages to Xenopus tropicalis, and I'm sure most people on this call are, are familiar with them. They include extremely large clutch sizes. These animals can produce over 4,000 embryos in an afternoon. Uh, they're extremely cost effective, uh, and they have a diploid genome, which makes genetic analysis more straightforward. Uh, but one of the things that I think is the coolest about Xenopus is the ability to manipulate just half of the animal divided by the midline. So for example, if we catch embryos at this two cell stage right after the first division of development, and we can inject one of these two blastomeres with CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing reagents, and as, long, as well as a dye, like a red dextran, and create animals that um, have only half of their body carrying a mutation of interest. In this case, I, I do autism risk gene mutations. And you can see in my background behind me, these are actually many neurula stage embryos in which I've mutated just half of the animal. Uh, importantly, this process is quick. It takes five days to get a free swimming behaving tadpole. And it's uh, cost effective, $25 per gene. And again, high throughput, we can produce over uh, several thousand of these animals in an afternoon. This is one example of what a, a genome edited tadpole will look like. For example, here I've mutated a gene required for eye pigmentation on the right half of this tadpole. And you can see an albino eye on the right compared to the control on the left. And this really highlights uh, a unique advantage of Xenopus uh, uh, biology in that we're able to compare phenotypes within the animal. So it's a nice controlled environment to do genetic analysis. These tadpoles are also um, strikingly beautiful. This is a very standard antibody stain against beta tubulin to image the entire nervous system of a tadpole. You can um, just with confocal microscopy or even with a stereo microscope, you can pick out the olfactory epithelium, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, eye, many different sensory nerves. Um, and I've also developed other tools to not just look at all neurons, but to be able to look at particular uh, cell types, including excitatory, inhibitory neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and many different imaging modalities to be able to take a look at them. And again, because we can do this half and half genetic analysis, we can now take these images and segment them and be able to compare your wild type cells to your manipulated mutant cells within the same animal, and again, in a vertebrate. Um, so we're really excited about this as a new platform for genetic analysis um, to meet this growing need, uh, given the amount of patient sequencing going on right now. And so some unpublished data is that uh, we've done this now for the top 10 autism risk genes. Uh, I'll walk you through this. This is an example of three of them. Uh, this is a control, again, that's that pigmentation gene. And when we image the brain and the controls, the forebrain is bilaterally symmetric. However, in these three autism risk gene mutants, what we see is either a decrease in telencephalon size, like for CHG8 or for Syngap. Um, and then we have a different group of genes like norexin, where we actually see the opposite phenotype and increase. 
I mean, so uh, within the top 10 genes here, all of them, we either see a decrease or an increase in telencephalon size. Um, and that one of these genes is DERK1A. I mean, so that's really the story I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a deep dive into one of these autism risk genes, DERK1A. And um, so here it is here, this is a CRISPR targeting the gene DERK1A and this tadpole here. And if we zoom in on the telencephalon, part of the forebrain, what we can see is a reduction in forebrain size when we inject a CRISPR. We also see this phenotype when we inject a morpholino targeting this gene. And additionally, when we bathe these embryos in a DERK1A kinase inhibitor, harming what we see is a similar effect now on telencephalon size, though of course because the entire animal has been treated, both sides are smaller. So you can see those effects here quantified. Um, and so because DERK1A uh, has so many different reagents available for it, and because it recapitulates this phenotype that we think is relevant to autism, because so many autism risk genes give this same phenotype of a smaller telencephalon size, we wanted to focus in on DERK1A more and really understand its molecular mechanisms during brain development. So some brief background on DERK1A, it's a high confidence, large effect autism risk gene, like I said, it's haploinsufficient. It's also located within the Down syndrome critical region on chromosome 21. So it seems to be incredibly dosage sensitive and an increase in dosage in Down syndrome uh, of DERK1A is, is thought to be important for the disorder. Now patients with DERK1A haplo insufficiency are known to have autism spectrum disorder as well as intellectual disability, microcephaly and congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. And so, and, uh, we know that patients show uh, microcephaly, a, a reduction in head size. And so we think that we're recapitulating uh, at least this part of the disorder and that we see a smaller forebrain size in our manipulated embryos. This is a schematic of the um, protein domains within DERK1A. Again, it's a conserved kinase. Um, and you can see that um, frame shift mutations and missense mutations are throughout the gene. Um, now, importantly, what we really wanted to study in, in this particular work was which of DERK1A's functions are involved in this brain growth phenotype. DERK1A has been extensively studied and reported on in the literature, and it's known to phosphorylate many different targets, including splicing factors in the nucleus, cyclin D during cell division, and also beta tubulin, a well-conserved role in uh, dendrite outgrowth. And so we wanted to start to understand which of its pleiotropic functions were relevant to this particular phenotype of brain size uh, during development, because again, we think that's important uh, for autism spectrum disorder. So one of the first things we did, and uh, with my co-first author, Yu Xiao Xu, is that we looked at the expression pattern of DERK1A mRNA during Xenophistropicalis development. And so uh, this is a, a in situ hybridization. And so you can see that DERK1A is expressed uh, throughout development, including in the dorsal lip of um, gastrulating embryos and the spinal cord and in the neural tissues and neurula stages, as well as in the ciliated epidermis and a punctate pattern. It's present in tail bud stages throughout the nervous system again, also in the pronephros, which will become the kidney and the, uh, the developing hearts, as well as in the pharyngeal arches and in the optic vesicle. Later on in tadpole stages, you see very strongly lining the ventricle where the proliferative cells are in the brain. And later on, you can see it um, largely throughout the brain and the later stage tadpoles. And so this punctate pattern here, as well as presence in the, in the kidney and the brain, and especially highly multiciliated tissues, uh, led us to start to wonder if DERK1A had a function in cilia. And indeed, when we used a uh, antibody against DERK1A, which we validated in the manuscript, what we saw was this beautiful punctate pattern along ciliary axonemes, here labeled with acetylated tubulin, DERK1A in green. And you can see it just beautifully along the ciliary axonemes, as well as along uh, the cell membrane here. When we look at tadpole stages with this antibody, you see it throughout the nervous system, but again, especially in these multiciliated cells here in the hindbrain and the fourth ventricle, also see it beautifully in the kidney. Again, another highly ciliated tissue. I mean, even lining the olfactory epithelium here, uh, again, on, in puncta on ciliary axonemes. 
So this led us to the question, is DERK-1A required for cilia genesis? What is its function on cilia? And what I'm showing you here is a control uh, multiciliated epidermis in the tail bud stages of Xenopus embryos uh, that we've now labeled the multiciliated cells and specifically the ciliary axonemes in, in magenta here with a, an a, a acetylated alpha tubulin antibody, uh, as well as the actin with phylloidin, and co-injected a centrin CFP mRNA to be able to look um, and find these multi multiciliated cells. And so when we knock down DERK-1A either with a morpholino or by CRISPR-Cas9 mutagenesis, what we see is a dramatic loss in these uh, ciliary axonemes. It looks like these cells are maybe still specified. However, they're unable to make cilia. So being that there's a ciliogenesis defect. And again, like I showed you earlier, we see this um, a defect in uh, telencephalon brain size, both for the morpholino and for the CRISPR and for this drug treatment. And what I didn't show you before, but is included here is a rescue of the DERK-1A CRISPR um, by co-injecting the human transcript for uh, DERK-1A. And so at least the, the human gene is able to rescue this function uh, when co-injected into Xenopus embryos. So next, what we really wanted to know is uh, why are these brains smaller? Uh, what is the molecular mechanism there? Is it related to ciliogenesis or is it a different pleiotropic function of DERK-1A during brain development? <clears throat> so to do that, we dissected brains um, from CRISPR injected animals um, and, and performed RNA sequencing on, on dissected brains. And so what you're seeing here is a schematic of the coding sequence for DERK-1A. We designed our guide RNA to be within this early exon. And what you'll see here, are RNA sequencing reads from our, our three replicates of DERK-1A CRISPR injected animals and our, our three replicates of uninjected controls. And what you'll see here is a drop in the RNA sequencing reads uh, just near the guide RNA like you would expect, validating that indeed we did target DERK-1A um, uh, with uh, mutagenesis. When we do a gene ontology enrichment, uh, as you may expect, considering the small brain size, what we found was um, a dramatic uh, enrichment for cell cycle processes, uh, uh, highlighting both S phase, but also highlighting microtubule skeleton organization and actually the spindle itself. Um, and so what was interesting is that, and remember that what we saw was a smaller brain size, but actually what we ended up seeing in the RNA sequencing data was a dramatic increase in cell cycle genes, including uh, cyclins and MCM families involved in DNA replication, and also an increase in genes like cyclin B and Aurora kinase B. And so this was a bit of um, a surprise for us uh, to actually see a upregulation of cell cycle genes, despite the fact that the brains were actually much smaller. And so this made us think um, about sort of how could you have this increase in these genes um, despite a smaller brain. And one of the hints we got was um, in that GO analysis where we saw the spindle and microtubule based processes. And so I'll remind you that, of course, cilia are a, a tubulin structure. Um, and as well is the mitotic spindle. And, and many times proteins that function on the cilia are also functioning to regulate microtubule dynamics on the mitotic spindle. And indeed, then when we looked at whether DERK-1A localized the mitotic spindle in early embryos, what we could see was this beautiful localization to the spindle as well as puncta along um, the spindle microtubules or at least near them. And so uh, what we hypothesized here was that perhaps DERK-1A, much like its role during ciliogenesis and regulating microtubules, perhaps during uh, cell division, DERK-1A localizes to the mitotic spindle and is required uh, for progression through cell cycle. And indeed, uh, what Yushao found was that when she looked at markers of cell cycle progression, including S phase markers like PCNA and N phase markers like phosphohistone 3, she saw that these cells seemed to be stalled during a cell cycle progression, both in S phase and N phase, leading to a dramatic increase in cell death here visualized by cleave caspase 3 staining. Uh, to, so to summarize, uh, what, what this paper really focuses on is a, is a role for DERK-1A both in ciliogenesis and in cell cycle control. And we think that both of these phenotypes may arise from a core function in regulating microtubule dynamics uh, that should be studied further. 
And uh, we think we've also uh, highlighted some potential insight into DERK1A comorbidities. We know that patients with DERK1A haploinsufficiency also show congenital defects in kidney development. Uh, of course, uh, that requires uh, cilia. And so, and we think that this may uh, not only provide insight into the neurodevelopmental disorder part uh, of DERK1A's function, but also for other organ systems as well. So in the future, um, I'm studying many more of these autism risk genes and their functions in the cell cycle, um, and also doing drug screening against now this DERK1A gene to understand mechanisms of resilience and how we may actually be able to treat these disorders. Um, and again, I told you there's this dramatic increase in our understanding of genetic risk for developmental disorders. And so I'm applying this same strategy in Xenopus towards Tourette disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, again, to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of this uh, genetic risk, and then also doing drug screening to identify mechanisms of resilience. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my mentors, uh, Matthew State at UCSF, and as well as Richard Harlan at UC Berkeley, and as well as um, uh, the co-authors on this paper. So please check it out. Um, I'd like to thank our Xenopus specific uh, uh, resources, as well as our funding sources and the Psychiatric Cell Mapping Initiative, especially. And one of the things I'm most proud of in my postdoc is bringing together clinical geneticists like Matthew State with developmental biologists like Richard Harland and being able to bridge this gap between our understanding of patient variation and the disorder risk with um, model organisms like Xenopus that can really be leveraged to understand molecular mechanisms of both development and, and disease. And so with that, um, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I would be happy to answer questions live or um, please shoot me an email if that's more convenient. So thank you. So we have a couple of questions that are rising to the top of the Q&A, Helen. Um, this is the question that I actually upvoted, and that is well, the person saying may have missed it, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about autism and brain size changes in humans? Is it just the car occurrence with microcephaly, or is there a tighter connection? Can you speak to that? There's been a whole body of literature noticing size changes and head circumference in autism for a long time. Um, what, what I didn't mention in the talk is that there's over 500 genes that can contribute risk to autism. And so you may imagine that some of them may cause an increase in brain size and others may cause a decrease. So how those uh, combine in an actual individual may change what that looks like uh, over time. And so um, it, that, that is something that's in the literature about head size. And, and what's interesting is that now that we have these high confidence, large effect risk genes, when we're able to find cohorts of patients that have a disruption in the same gene, now you're able to see, yes, all patients with CHDA haploinsufficiency have macrocephaly. All of the ones with ZERC1A haploinsufficiency have microcephaly. So it seems to be dependent on which gene is disrupted, but it's certainly, uh, there's evidence for it in the patient population. Cool, thank you. That actually leads really well into the, the next kind of related question which came initially from James Briscoe, and that is, are the ciliogenesis defects in DERK1A restricted? So not just to the brain, we saw the defects in the multiciliated cells, but what about these other things, the kidney defects that, that you saw in the patients, can you also get those, or is it a more uh, tissue-specific ciliogenesis function? Yeah, so I, I think it's likely that the, um, in many of the tissues where DERK1A is expressed that there will be ciliogenesis defects. We obviously haven't dealt with it um, in this paper. Um, I know Rachel Miller, is very interested in what's going on with the kidney. Um, and she has shown kidney defects in DERK1A morphins. Um, and so I would not be surprised to be to if the cilia are also disrupted in those tissues. But again, I think I think there is some tissue specificity. You know, in the brain, we don't see midline defects. Um, and so in that sense, okay. uh, what we really see there is a smaller brain, but not necessarily hedgehog related okay. uh, cilia genesis problems there. So there may well, be some tissue specificity, but I think there, you know, the kidney problems and, and potential heart defects may be explained by cilia genesis defects. Okay, cool. And so one last question, and we don't have a whole lot of time, and it's kind of a big question, but I'll just give you a second to comment on it. And it really was talking about uh, magnificent images, uh, clearly. And, and where's the limit for using frog as a model? Like, what, what can we take away from it in terms of extrapolating the human disease? And where do we have to say, yeah, 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 we can't? Uh, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, such an important question. Uh, you know, I don't like to talk about our deficits as a model, but, uh, you know, obviously there are some um, cell types and, and things that are obviously specific to humans, and we're not going to be able to capture those in frogs. Uh, the way I think about frogs is a, is a first step, is being able to look at many genes in parallel, start to be able to say, okay, it's the forebrain or it's the hindbrain, right? Because at this point, for most of these developmental disorders, autism, Tourette disorder, OCD, we don't know what, what cell type, what brain region, what general function, and so I think frogs are a great way to do a first pass to narrow the search space. And then we need to go into human cell, cell models and be able to understand, you know, more about the specific nature of, of these uh, genetic perturbations and human specific systems. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you very much.